yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, blimey, thank you. Thank you. I've got a microphone. I don't think I need a microphone, really, do I? But let's put that there. Well, listen, thank you all for coming this Saturday morning. It's funny on a Saturday morning doing a children's event, isn't it? It's good fun. Right, my name is Rob. Um, does anyone has anyone done some drawing with me during the pandemic, during the lockdown? A few of you, a few of you have done that. Well, we're going to be doing some drawing a bit later. That's why you've got your little sketchbooks and your pencils. But we don't need them for a little while yet. Oh, some more people coming in. Hello there. Hello. Um, uh, first of all, this is what I thought I was going to I would do today. I thought I'd read you a couple of stories. Well, we'll do a little warm-up story first of all, okay? Then I'll tell you a little bit about how I became an author, because I know there's at least one budding author in the, the audience. So I thought I'd tell you how I became one. That might help you out if you're wanting to become one yourself. And then I might read a bit from my brand new book. Does that sound like a good plan? Jolly good. Right. So we're in London, right? Central London. Hands up, who knows what London is famous for? Young man. Oh, you can. <laughs> yeah, come on. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah, they do. That's very good. Do you want to come this way? We'll be careful. Why don't you come down the steps? We don't want you to get hurt. Go down the steps. There we go. Yes, that is true. All of that is true. They build tall buildings to house all the people because cities are very busy. But that wasn't what I was thinking of. It's the capital city of England, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> that is true, but that's not what I was thinking of. You? It's famous for you. Oh, no, I see. You asked if I was asking. Yeah, yeah, yes, you. Fish and chips. <laughs> That is a very good answer. And uh, no, that wasn't what I was thinking of. One more guess. Big Ben. Big Ben. No, that's not what I'm thinking of either. Shall I tell you? I'm going to tell you what London is famous for. London is famous for aliens. <laughs> didn't you know this? You didn't know. London is the capital city for aliens in the whole world. There are more aliens in London than anywhere else in the whole world. It's true. You didn't know this. None of you knew this. Well, do you know why that is? It's because aliens are masters of disguise. It's true. So that's probably why you don't know that London is so famous for aliens. Do you know what aliens like to disguise themselves as? There's two things. Teachers. Teachers. And parents, <laughs> they really <laughs> like to disguise themselves as parents. And they're so good at disguising themselves as parents that it's really hard to tell if a parent is an alien or not. But there is one trick that you can use, and it's very, very simple. You just ask them. If they say no, that means they're an alien. OK, we're going to test it out now. Let's just see. Excuse me, madam. Uh, are you an alien? She said, no, we need to keep an eye on her. Right, guys, so I need you to pay attention, okay? If you see a little alien like this on my big screen behind me, I need you to shout alien as loud as you can to warn me, okay? So we're going to have a practice. You ready? One, two, three. Alien! Perfect, perfect. So just keep an eye on my screen and you let me know. Right, as I said, we're going to start with a warm-up story, and it's a very short story about a very, very, very long doggy. Who knows what kind of dog that is? Yes. Sausage. A sausage dog. That's right. And this story is called Odd Dog Out. Are you ready? Are you ready for the story? No, there was not. Where? I see. That's how it's going to be, is it? You guys playing tricks on me. I don't know. Taking advantage of my better nature. <laughs> right, here we go. For busy dogs, a busy day of busy work and busy play. Swimmer, sailor, soldier, scout. They all blend in. No dog stands out. 
but wait. Look closer. Can you see one dog behaving differently? Someone on this busy street is dancing to a different beat. Which dog is different? Which one? The one with the rainbow scarf, that's right. When they fly high, this dog flies low. When they say kick, this dog says throw. Oh, it's very sad, cue violin, but this small dog <gasps> does not fit in. It's true, she sniffs. I've tried my best, but I'm not made like all the rest. And that's why I've made up my mind to leave this town, my home, behind. On her own and out of place, she sighs a sigh and packs her case. Through winter, springtime, summer, fall, from ocean deep to mountain tall, she walks till she can walk no more. <gasps> Is this the place she's looking for? Well, bless my bow wow, can it be a hundred others? Just like me. I play guitar, I ride a bike, I fit right in. We're all alike. But wait, look closer. Can you see one dog behaving differently? Somebody this afternoon is whistling a different tune. <gasps> Which dog is different to everybody else this time? That one. This one. Here's something she knows all about. A classic case of odd dog out. Poor thing, she says. I feel for you. I once was an outsider too. Oh, not at all. You've got it wrong. I really feel like I belong. I love to stand out from the crowd. And so should you. Stand tall. Be proud. Her tummy flips. Her belly flops as finally... The penny drops. That dog is right. It's plain to see there's nothing wrong with being me. Her little tail begins to wag. She smiles a smile and grabs her bag. Oh, I'm sorry, but I have to fly. Good luck, my friend. They wave goodbye. From night and moon to light and sun, her journey home has just begun. Four busy dogs, a busy day. <gasps> but look who's back. Hip, hip, hooray, they cheer, they clap, they whoop, they shout. <gasps> We've really missed our odd dog out. You've made us all appreciate that being different is really great. It's true. Look closer. Can you see more dogs behaving differently? Each one a doggy superstar. <laughs> it's my favourite, that one. So blaze a trail. Be who you are. And there we go. That is the end of my first little story. And that is a stor story Excuse me, all about a sausage dog who doesn't fit in with all the other sausage dogs. So she goes away to find somewhere where she does fit in. And in the course of doing that, she realises, actually, the best thing you can be is yourself. Right? That's right, isn't it? So, speaking... Oh, being yourself. Where? Right. Are you saying, are you saying if I turn around now and look at the screen, I'll see an alien? Is that what you're saying? All right, I'm going to trust you on this. Okay, you ready? Oh, guys. I don't know. I don't know, you guys. Right. So speaking of being yourself, hands up. Who knows what they want to be when they grow up? Let's have a look. What do you want to be when you... An author or illustrator. Wow. I think I know. You have so many things to do. <laughs> I, so I don't know if you heard. She's got so many talents. She's going to have to write them down on a list because she doesn't know what to do. I feel that's poor you. Poor you. What about you? Oh, do you? And be up on the stage. Fabulous. Any more? What do you want to be when you grow up? I 
Oh, well, that's so lovely. So many budding authors and illustrators in the audience. <coughs> Where? <laughs> I nearly saw that one, didn't I? <laughs> it's almost like... <laughs> work on my time right um, <laughs> okay speaking of aliens <laughs> this is a picture of me when I was about five or six years old when I was about five or six years old there were two things that I wanted to be when I grew up one was a footballer there I am with my football my uncle was a footballer I wanted to be a bit like him but the other thing was an illustrator a bit like you now an illustrator is somebody who draws pictures for their job the reason I wanted to be an illustrator is because of this drawing here now, I did this drawing when I was in reception at school. So I was about four years old, and at my school, there was a competition. Everyone in the whole school could enter. You just had to draw a picture of something to do with the summer fair that we were having at our school. So I drew this picture of some children dancing around um, a maypole. And I don't know if you can see, but right up there, somebody has written a little letter P in the corner. Is that the beginning of your name? Oh, there you go. Hello, Peggy. Nice to meet you. <laughs> um, but this time, this piece doesn't stand for Peggy, it stands for prize. Because I was very lucky and I won first prize in the drawing competition. First prize in the whole school. And I remember the day that my head teacher came into the classroom and he said, right, which one of you is Robert? And I thought, oh no, I'm in trouble. I've done something wrong. And so I stood up and I went to the front of the class and he said, congratulations, you've won first prize in the drawing competition in the whole school. <gasps> I couldn't believe it. I was so excited. Mainly because I wanted to find out what my prize was going to be. It's probably going to be like a new bike, isn't it? Something like that. Or maybe, I don't know, a Nintendo Switch. Something cool like that. Oh, no. Do you know what my prize was? A pencil. <laughs> I know. doesn't sound very exciting, does it? But do you know what? I treasured that pencil. I loved that pencil because that pencil stood for something. It stood for the fact that someone thought I was good at drawing. And I don't think anyone had ever really said that to me before. So what happened was, because someone said that I was good at drawing, as I got older and even more stylish, do you think I look pretty cool? <laughs> pretty cool, huh? Pretty cool. As I got older and even more stylish, I carried on drawing. One of my favourite things to do was take my favourite characters from the books that my parents and my teachers would read to me at school, and I'd write my own stories for those characters. I'd draw the pictures, I'd staple them up one side, and make them into little books that I'd hand out to my family and my friends. I spend a lot of time making my own comics. You know, I'd invent all these different characters, write little stories for them, draw the voice bubbles, even do the kind of puzzle pages. And again, I'd get my dad to photocopy the comics and I'd hand them out to my friends at school. Another thing that I used to do a lot of was copying, copying my favourite cartoon characters. Now, lots of people think that copying is cheating. When it comes to art, I don't think it is. It's actually a really good way of getting better at drawing because you get to see how other artists put their drawings together. You know, you see how they draw ears and noses, and that can help you when it comes to inventing your own character. So it's actually a really, really useful thing to do. No, it's a cat, not an alien. And um, <laughs> come on, guys, aliens are green. Um, <laughs> uh, I think I did this one here when I was about 10. So by the time I was about 10, I was getting really good at things like, you know, going slow when you get to the edges, when you're colouring, that sort of thing, trying to get neater and neater. And because I was drawing so much, I was getting better and better at it. Because drawing's like anything else. It's like piano. If you want to get good at playing the piano, you have to practice, right? It's exactly the same with drawing. The more you do it, the more confident you get and the better you get at it. So by the time I was about 10, my teachers at school started saying, actually, we think you're really quite good at drawing. Maybe when, you're, when you turn 18, you should think about going to a place called art college. What's our college, I said. And they said, it's just like school, but you get to draw and paint all the time. And I thought, well, that sounds pretty good to me. So as I got older and older and older, I kept on practicing, kept on drawing and painting. By the time I turned 18, off I went to art college where I spent three years painting fruit. Okay, that's what I did. You name a fruit, I probably did a painting of it. Okay, but when it, <laughs> avocado, good one. Um, is that a fruit? Yeah, it is. Anything with a seed. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm always getting educated by children these days. Always. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, when it came to the time for me to leave university and get a job, I could not find a job as an apple painter anywhere or an avocado painter. No fruit painting jobs around at the time. So I ended up going to work for lots of very famous newspapers and magazines, designing the pages. And it was a nice job. It was a nice job. But I always used to remember those days 
when I used to make my own comics, make my own children's books. And I used to think, oh, that would have been a nice thing to do for my actual job. Then something happened to me that changed everything. I had children. These are my three girls. The little one is Poppy. I nearly forgot her name then. The little one is Poppy. The middle one is Kitty. The big one is Ella. Can you see this cat? Can you see this cat that snuck into the bottom of my picture? That's my cat. Now, there's two things you need to know about my cat. The first is that she is a perfectly round cat, okay? Like a perfectly round ball of cat. That's the first thing you need to know. The second thing is she's got a really embarrassing name. In fact, I may, I, you know what? I don't, I don't think I can tell you my cat's name. All right, if I tell you, you're not going to laugh, are you? You wouldn't do that, would you? All right. Yeah, you would. <laughs> At least you're honest. <laughs> All right, this cat, perfectly round cat, <sighs> she is called Cat Face. <laughs> I know, isn't that a silly name? The reason she's called Cat Face, she's not one of those cats, we didn't get her in a pet shop. Oh no, she just turned up in the garden one day and we would say, oh look, Cat Face is back again. Before we knew it, she'd moved in with us. And now, the most embarrassing thing is when I have to take her to the vets to get her injections, because <laughs> when you're at the vets and it's your turn to go in to see the vet, and you're in the waiting room full of other people, it's not your name, it's not my name. They don't call Rob, they call the cat's name. So can you imagine, I'm sitting there, perfectly round cat on my lap, cat face Bidolf, and I have to stand up and everyone laughs at me. <laughs> it's not even the most embarrassing pet name in my family, because my brother, that's not my brother, I should say, <laughs> But <laughs> my brother has a little dog. This is my brother's dog. And when they got this dog, they thought it would be a good idea to let their little girl choose the name. Now, their little girl was only two years old at the time. And they said, right, whatever you pick, that is what we are going to call this dog. So wait till you hear this. If you thought cat face was a silly name, and it's not dog face before you guess. You know what it is, don't you? You know what it is. You all know what it is. <laughs> Go on then. Somebody tell me what it is. Toothpaste. This dog is called Toothpaste the dog. Isn't that silly? And th again, sometimes we have to look after Toothpaste the dog when my brother goes on holiday. So if you see a man in North London standing in the middle of a park shouting out Toothpaste at the top of his voice with a hat on and some glasses, you'll know that he's not going crazy. It's just me looking after my brother's dog. This is my dog. Who knows what my dog's name is? Ringo! There he is. He wanted to come along today, but they wouldn't let him in the cinema, so I'm afraid he couldn't be here. So I thought I'd show you a little video, because he just wanted to say hello to you all. Right. Where was I? Yes, something happened to me, changed everything. I had children. We started buying... There's an alien? Where? There isn't? You want there to be one? Okay, well, let's see, shall we? Let's see. Keep those eyes peeled. When my children were young, we started buying lots of picture books to read to them at bedtime. Has anyone read this one? Yeah, you've read this one. I'm going to show you some of the other ones we read. If you recognize any of them, let me know. Have you seen that one there, where the wild things are? What about this one? Yeah, you recognize that one. There'll be some you know, some you don't know. But these were our favorites when they were little. I bet all of you have read the last one. This one. You read that one, The Tiger Who Came to Tea. Well, we would read all these stories as bedtime stories, and again, I would think to myself, "Ah, oh, these look like nice things to make. I, I think I might be able to. I think I might be able to draw the pictures for a children's book, and I think I might be able to write a story." But I didn't really know, and so I thought to myself, "Right, you know what? If you don't try, you never know, do you?" So I thought, "I'm going to have a go. I'm going to have a go at writing the story, and I'm going to have a go at drawing the pictures to go in the book too." And remember earlier I said, if you want to get good at something, you need to practice. Well, I thought, I need to practice some things that children like looking at, okay? Practice drawing some things that they like looking at. So I went away with my pens and my pencils, and I drew a pirate ship. And I drew some dinosaurs. And I drew some spaceships and aliens and all that sort of thing. Different kind of alien, though, that one, isn't it? So well done for not shouting out. That's very, very <laughs> impressive. No, that's what I just said. They're a different kind of alien. The alien you want. No, the aliens you want are the ones with the tentacles. Okay, they're the ones you've got to keep an eye on. I don't know. <laughs> trust us. <laughs> All right, I'll try and trust you. I'll try and trust you. I thought I need to practice drawing children themselves. Here we go. Here's some girls. Here's some boys. And then I thought, oh, there's always lots of animals in children's books, isn't there? So I need to draw some animals. 
We have lions and tigers and elephants and dogs and cats and alligators. Here we go. Over here, we've got a great big tower of meerkats. We've got whales, peacocks, owls, giraffes, all sorts of animals. And what I did with all these drawings, I printed all these drawings onto great big pieces of paper. I put those pieces of paper into a folder. I put that folder under my arm. I got on the tube and I came into the middle of London, close to where we are now, which is where all the publishers work. Publishers are the people that make books. And I went into their offices and I said, right, I put all my drawings on a big table. and I said, right, what do you think? Am I good enough to make my own children's book. And they said, actually, we really like your drawings. We think you might be good enough. And when they got to this page in particular, there was one group of animals that they liked more than any other. Hands up, who wants to have a guess at which of the animals? Let's see. Let's see. Yes, you. The penguins. You're right, first time. It was the penguins. They said to me, we really like your penguin drawings. Do you think you can come up with a story for them? So I thought to myself, right, penguins, they're a kind of bird, right? But what is different about penguins to most other kinds of birds? They can't fly, can they? So I thought, well, I'm going to write a story about a penguin who does fly. How can I get him up into the sky? <gasps> I know. What if he goes out flying a kite on a very windy day and ends up getting blown away? So I wrote this story here about Penguin Blue. He goes out with his kite. He does indeed get blown away. His friends try and help him, but they all get blown away right across the sea, and they end up in a place that penguins aren't usually found. They end up in a jungle island and they have to think of a clever way of getting back home again. So I wrote the story, I drew the pictures, showed that to the publishers, the people that make the books, and said, right, what do you think? And they said, we like it. We're going to turn it into an actual real life book. <gasps> I couldn't believe it because for me, this was a dream come true. And even now when I see my book in the shops or on the shelf in a library or in a school, I have to pinch myself to make sure that I'm not dreaming because it doesn't, still doesn't quite feel real that it's happened to me, that uh, my name is on top of an actual real-life book. But do you know what? The best thing about it was they let me write more books. So I wrote one about a bear who loses his growl, called Grr, Odd Dog Out, which I read to you just now. I wrote one about pirate penguins, which was a really fun one to write. No, pirates. Come on, guys. Head in the game. Um, I wrote my, my middle daughter, Kitty, had an imaginary friend called Kevin. He only ever used to show up when she was in trouble. So if her room was a mess, it was never her fault. It was Kevin that did it. So I said to her one day, right, what does this Kevin look like? She said, well, he's ever so tall and he's ever so wide and he's covered in vanilla colored fur with pink spots and he's only got one tooth. She said it like that quickly. And I was like, right, 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 hang on, hang on. And I got my pen and I started drawing. And that's where the idea for this story came from. So my advice to you is always be ready to receive ideas because you never know where they're going to come from and you can, might be able to write a book about it if you want to be authors. I wrote lots of dinosaur stories. I wrote one called Show and Tell. Yes, I was waiting. I can see that one. Look, there he is. I was waiting. You've got to keep, there's a couple here. You've really got to keep your eyes peeled to spot them, okay? Um, and I wrote one. My most recent picture book is called Dog Gone, all about a dog who loses his human. Sometimes I get to draw pictures on other people's books too. Have any, has anyone ever read the Flat Stanley books? Mm, so yeah, they've been around for a long time. Not that, not, I don't mean, not that long. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> A little while they've been around for. <laughs> um, anyway, I do the drawings for the Flat Stanley books. Does anyone know who Michael Bond is? What's Michael, what's Michael Bond famous for writing? Does anyone know? Paddington, very good, very clever young lady there. He wrote all the Paddington books, and he also wrote some stories about a lion called Parsley. And uh, last year they asked me to illustrate um, his Parsley the Lion story, so I was very honoured to be able to do that. So I get to do all these fun things things and I feel again I feel very very lucky but the reason I'm telling you all about this is because I want you to to um, remember that you know that drawing I did when I was like in reception there's a straight line from me doing that to me becoming an author now lots of things happened along that straight line it was a little bit bumpy maybe it wasn't that straight a bit I didn't even I forgot about that one well done yes can you see it where is he there he is alien good spot <laughs> Red light. <laughs> um, yeah, lots of things happened along that line, but the main thing that happened was that I kept on practicing and I didn't give up. So my message to you guys, especially the ones who want to be authors, is don't give up. Keep on practicing. It might be hard and it might take a long time, but if you're determined enough and you get a bit of luck on your way, then you can be whatever you want to be. Okay. So that is my message to you guys today. Right.
Nearly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. Let's see. Let's try again. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> I nearly saw that one. I'm starting to believe that you might be telling me the truth, actually. Right. What's that thing? It's a pencil. Okay. That one's a pencil. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have to control the slides, don't I? It's my little remote control. control I don't control the alien. I'm not the alien overlord. I don't control the aliens. <laughs> draw with Rob. Who did draw with Rob with me then? We had this question already, haven't we? Yeah, lots of you did draw with Rob with me during lockdown. For those that didn't, let's see if this works. Here we go, a little video. So what draw with Rob was, right at the beginning of the pandemic, I thought there's going to be lots of children looking for things to do. You know this dinosaur, do you? I did. did you? I thought there's going to be lots of children looking for things to do because the schools were closed. More importantly, there's going to be lots of parents looking for things for their children to do. So I thought, right, I will record myself for, for drawing some of my characters. I've done this before. I did it a few years before, actually. Um, and I do it on stage at all my live events. So I thought, I'll record myself doing it. I'll pop it up online and see what happens, see if anyone's interested. I had the idea on the Sunday, recorded the first video on the Monday, put it up on YouTube on the Tuesday, and suddenly found myself on News at 10 on the Wednesday. It was very strange how popular it became very, very quickly. And it was really, really lovely because I started getting sent so many pictures of drawings from children who drawn along with me. And what I really love about these is the fact that we all started off drawing exactly the same thing. You know, I was showing everybody how to draw the same thing. But look how different everybody's drawings are. And I think that is the beauty of art. There is no right or wrong answer. Everyone puts a bit of themselves into their drawings and you end up with lots and lots and lots of different types of drawings. And they're all as good as, as no, there's no drawings that are better than any other drawings. And I really love them. And at the time during the pandemic, there was lots of sort of miserable and sad stories around and everyone was quite anxious. And this was, for me at least, a real kind of little oasis of joy in this kind of desert of worry. And so it was really lovely to see all your drawings. Did anyone do this one with me? Some of you. Do you know why this one was a special one? The Guinness World Record, that's right. We broke the Guinness World Record for the largest ever online art class. That's me. There I am. Big, big picture of my big old face up there on the board. And that was really, really fun because, for, as it says there, nearly, what was it, 45,500 households joined in with me. We think it was about 120,000 people joined in with me and were drawing the whale at exactly the same time. And it was super fun. And even today when I'm taking Ringo out for a walk, I sometimes see kind of faded drawings of whales stuck in people's windows and it's a really nice thing to do. And a lovely thing for us all to be doing together when we're all stuck at home on our own. It was a really nice way of bringing people together. Everyone said to me, can you do a video every single day? And I was like, well, no. Where? Oh yeah, there's a few aliens. <sighs> You guys are really good. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I thought, they said, can you do one every day? And I was like, well, I've got to actually write some books of my own at some point. So what I thought I'd do is make some books that people could then look at every single day. And they could do a drawing every day if they want, wanted to. And the latest one is all about monsters, right? This one's a test for you. I'm waiting. There he is, look, can you see? Hiding, there he is. <laughs> Anyway, I thought that right now we would do a little bit of live drawing together. Is that all right? So you've all got a piece of paper, a little sketchbook, and a pencil. I thought we would do a quick picture together. But to do a draw with Rob, we need to hear our theme tune, don't we? So here we go. There we go. And the music goes down as if by magic. Right. OK. Can you all see what you're doing? It's very dark, isn't it? You might have to use a phone torch or something. Um, right. So we're going to do this drawing together. For anyone who hasn't done uh, a draw with Rob before, this is how it works. We're going to break this drawing down into little bite-sized pieces. Lots of people tell me they don't think they're very good at drawing. I say, well, do you know what? Everybody can draw. It's just that some people need a little bit of help with the order that we do the drawing in. And that's where I come in, because I'm going to show you. So I'm going to draw a little bit of the drawing up here on my piece of paper. Then I'm going to stop, and you're going to copy what I do. Then I will draw some more. Then you draw. I draw. You draw. I draw. You draw. I draw. You draw. And by the end of it, we're going to end up with some lovely works of art, OK? Right. 
This is a really fun way to start a drawing. It's my favourite way we've ever done to start a drawing. Because what we are going to do is scribble right in the middle of your piece of paper. I want you to do a scribble. We're going to try and keep your scribble quite sort of round. Okay, so keep it in a rough, roughly circular shape like that. Okay, but you can do any sort of scribble you want. You can make it as neat or as messy as you want, as long as it's sort of in a circle and you've left a bit of space around it to do some more drawing. So that sort of thing. You've done your scribble. Very good, good scribbling. Perfect scribbling. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is coming out of the top of our scribble, right in the middle, very good, we are going to draw a vertical line about that tall, coming straight up out of the middle, like that. Looks a bit like a pom-pom. Exactly. I know, I copied her. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I'm going to be using that in every single show I do to them. Uh, cherry. Yes, cherry pom-pom. Right, the next thing we're going to do is we are going to go slightly downhill from the top of that line, like that. Then... We are going to go slightly horizontally, very short. Then we are going uphill that way. Then we are going straight down. Like that. I'll come around this way. Can you see it over there, guys? Okay. Now, we are going to go downhill again, but we are going to go much kind of longer and shallower downhill. So we're going to come right down like that and go towards the edge of our piece of paper. Then from that point, we are going to go straight down our page until we're roughly level with the top of our scribble, like that. And then finally, in this little shape we're drawing, we're going to go across into our scribble, like that. A dog. You might be right. You think it's a llama, do you? Well, let's see, shall we? <laughs> All will become clear. Right, the next thing we need to do is in these... Uh, do you know what? I'm going to tell you. It is a dog, okay? It is a dog. And our dog... These two bits here are dog's ears, okay? So we need to add inside those ears, I want you to draw two little tiny triangles like that, just inside. Because dogs have that sort of strange lining in their ears, don't they? I've seen that before. Should we wake our dog up? Let's wake our dog up. Let's give our dog a couple of eyes. We're going to draw a big circle underneath the ears, like that. And do you know what? Because this is a cartoon dog, we're going to do both the circles on this side of the head. So we're going to do another one next to it. Like that. Okay? So it's a bit like a number eight on the side. And then inside each of those, we're going to do a smaller circle that we colour in. And look, our little dog is awake. Okay, we'll do a nose and mouth, shall we? Yeah, but noses are very important for dogs. They love sniffing around stuff, don't they? So let's do the nose first. What I want you to do is right up in this corner here, I want you to draw like a quarter circle. So a bit like if you like playing football, it's a bit like a, or, or hockey, it's a bit like a corner marking on a hockey or a football pitch. Like a quarter circle. Yeah. Now, do you remember earlier I said, you know, copying people is really good because you get to see how they draw certain parts of a character. Well, if anyone has been doing lots of drawing with me, you will have seen how I do nostrils on animals. I do them like a little swirly-whirly thing, don't I? I don't know why I do that. I just think I really like doing swirly-whirly bits. I always do it, and I do it on my R of my name, you're right. But I'm going to do a little swirly bit on the side of this nose to, make our, to give our dog a nice nostril to sniff about with. So what we do is we go that way, and we just swirl it around like that to make a little nostril. Then, it's time to do the mouth, but before we do the mouth, we need to do a little vertical line just coming out of our quarter circle, but stopping before we get to the bottom of our dog's head. So stopping just short of the bottom. It doesn't want to. That's good. We don't want it to get to the bottom. Then, along the bottom of that, going all the way along the face, we're going to do a great big long mouth that comes up in a big smile like that in between the eyes to make our dog nice and smiley. Can you see it now? <laughs> 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 
Okay. When this is another thing that I think I've talked about in a lot of my videos, maybe somebody can tell me. If you want to make someone look extra smiley, what do you add? Eyebrows. The key is the eyebrows. So we're going to add a couple of eyebrows. Do them quite a long way above the eyes like that. And look, extra smiley. And also another little trick, whenever you're drawing any animals, if you want to make them look even more animal-like, just add four little dots next to their sort of nose. And it just looks like whiskers. And that's a really good little cartoon trick. I don't know why it works, but it just works. It makes an animal look like an animal. There we go. I've added some on the other side there too. Okay, now I am going to, I'm going to add some faint little vertical lines here just to give my dog, just to shade my dog's head in a little bit. You don't have to do that if you don't want to. It's up to you. I'm, doing, I'm just pressing very lightly and just doing a bit of rough scribble like that. You can, you can color it in properly when you get home if you want to. Okay, time to give our dog some legs. Now, this is the point when I tell you that illustrators are all very lazy. Okay, we like to try and do the least amount of work possible whenever possible. You will see what I mean when I do these legs. Ready? One, two, three, four. That's it. That's it. I'm definitely not kidding, I tell you. They are my dog's legs. The tail, actually, let's make, I'll make them a little bit thicker. We'll make them a little bit thicker, seeing as you're the alien. I don't know, you're the guy, you're the ones keeping an eye out for aliens, not me. Okay, we're going to give our dog a tail. We're just going to draw another little line, but we're going to sort of do it curving upwards like that. We might add a bit of scribble on this to make it a little bit more furry. Like a little tufty tail. And then I'm going to show you my final trick. Again, I always talk about this. This is the one where ever you're drawing somebody standing on the ground and you want to make it look like, go on then, shadow. That's right, we're going to add a bit of scribbly shadow just around the feet, just like that. Really easy, really effective. It makes it look like your animal is standing on the ground. The very last thing we need to do is we need to sign our drawing. Write your name so everyone knows who's created this work of art. When you've done that, hold them up and I'll see if I can see them. It's a bit dark out there, but I might be able to see your drawings. Come on, Laura. I mean, that's a bit too good. Slightly annoying. <laughs> Slightly annoyingly good. That is brilliant. I love it. Full of character. Very good down here, Mum. Excellent work. Let's have a look. Let's come over here. Excellent. Callum, right? Brilliant. Amazing. I can see yours, Rory. That is brilliant. Amazing. Everyone's looks slightly different. Again, it's that thing, isn't it? We all started off the same way. Oh, look at this spotlight. Beautifully done. Oh, lovely drawings. Amazing. Excellent. <gasps> Fabulous, guys. They're so good. I love them. And brilliant down the front here. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Wow, yours is quite a lot better than mine. Excellent work. Very good, everybody. <laughs> well, do you know what? If you want to do that, you can go home and you can have a look at my videos because I've got like a hundred of them and you can draw any animal you like. But don't worry because you're going to see a little thing. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this dog that we've drawn in a second. All right. So. Can you see these pictures that I've drawn? Oh, sorry, I haven't seen yours yet. That's lovely. Let's go back. We'll go back. We'll go back. We'll look at that in a minute. Let's have a look. Beautiful. Oh, very good shadow there. Very, very convincing. Can you show me yours? I'll have you. Let's have a look. Oh, yeah. Oh, crikey. <laughs> That's a bit scary. Right. Let me move this to one side again. Right. Lots of people ask me where ideas for stories come from. In fact, we were talking earlier about story ideas a bit, weren't we, and about having too many ideas. Well, ideas, as I mentioned earlier, ideas can come from anywhere. You just have to be ready to receive them. Because if you're anything like me, an idea can pop into your head one minute, and then pop out of it again the next minute. So you always have to be ready to make a little note of your ideas. That is my tip to you. I always make a little note of an idea on my phone, even if it's just a few words. Quickly scribble it down so I don't forget it. I have a shadow. Oh, yeah, I do. Um, <laughs> I, if I didn't have a shadow, that would make me a vampire, wouldn't it? So I'm quite glad that I've got a shadow. <coughs> I'm not a vampire. Um, <laughs> right. 
So these drawings here, this is something that I did for my youngest daughter. Now, when she started at primary school, she was really nervous about staying for lunch. So somebody had the idea that, that I should maybe draw a little picture on a post-it note, <coughs> and we would, um, and then I would hide it in her lunchbox so that when she opened her lunch, she had a little message from me, and it would make her feel a little bit happier that she was staying at school for lunch. And I did the drawing on the very first day, and she came home and she said, oh, I love the drawing, what are you going to do tomorrow? And I said, well, actually, I thought this was like a one-time only gig. I didn't realise I was doing it again. And then in the end, I ended up doing one every single day that she was at primary school. So I ended up doing about 2,000 of these drawings, okay? <laughs> and um, was the alien there? I didn't see the alien there. Anyway, when I was doing all of these drawings, I had a sort of niggling feeling in the back of my head that there was a really good idea for a children's book here somewhere. Now, I didn't quite know what that idea was, but I knew it was there. So when that happens, when you know there's the germ of an idea, the beginning of an idea, I think there's two very important words that you need to keep repeating to yourself. The first one is what, and the second one is if. Okay, so what if. So you have the start of an idea, and you start asking yourself, what if this happens? What if that happens? And soon the idea will grow. I'll show you what I mean. So what if there was a little girl, right? A kind of a cross between two of my daughters. Here she is, OK? This is the little girl that's a cross between the two of my daughters. What if she had quite a funny name? Let's say her name is Peanut, OK? Peanut Jones, we're going to call her. What if she has a best friend? Here he is. And what if his name is Rockwell? And what if she has a little sister? Okay. And what if her little sister's name is Elizabeth? But what if she can't say it properly, so she calls herself Little Bit? Okay. So we have three characters. We have Peanut, Rockwell, and Little Bit. That's the start of a story. You start with characters quite often. Now, what if Peanut is a bit like my daughter, and she has a dad who draws a little picture on a post-it note for her to hide in her lunchbox every day. But what if her dad has mysteriously disappeared a year or so before our story starts? <gasps> Suddenly, a new, a new kind of story is starting to emerge. And what if one day she is lying on her bed and she is looking through all of her post-it notes that she keeps in a little wooden box here, she empties all the post-it notes onto her bed like that, but she notices there's a little rattling sound from within that wooden box. So what if she looks inside that box and she finds a little secret hidden compartment at the bottom, and inside that secret hidden compartment is... <laughs> Dad. <laughs> that would be amazing. That's going to be in the next book. Um, what if she finds a pencil like this? And it's a beautiful pencil. It looks more like a sculpture of a pencil than an actual pencil itself. It looks like it's been carved out of wood. And what if she picks up that pencil and it feels really, really nice? It's perfectly balanced. And she decides she's going to do a drawing with it. And what if she draws a picture of a flower in a vase? And she's really pleased with that picture. So pleased that she pins it up to her wall next to her bed. And then off she goes to sleep. But what if in the morning she wakes up and the flower has wilted? <gasps> so what if? What if it's a magic picture? What if whatever she draws with this pencil, it's a magic pencil. So what if it, whatever she draws with it comes to life? Lots of what ifs. And you can see we've got the start of a story. Okay. So what if I then wrote a book about this? And what if? This is that book. So it's called Peanut Jones and the Illustrated City. And I thought I would very quickly, we've got time, I thought I would quickly read you one chapter from the book, the very short chapters, don't you worry. Is that all right? Okay, so this is where we're at in the story at the point I'm going to read to you, okay? So Peanut here has just drawn that flower. She's put it up on her wall and she's woken up in the morning. The flower has wilted. So she thinks it might be a magic pencil. She thinks that whatever she draws might become real. So on the way to school that morning, she meets her friend Rockwell, who gives her an apple, and says, look, this weird thing happened last night. I drew this flower and it wilted and became, look, it was like it became real. And Rockwell, whose favourite subject at school is science, said, oh, that's impossible. That can't happen. So he said, well, 
I know that, but it did happen. It, honestly, it did. Here's the pencil. This is, that's what happened. So Rockwell says, I like science. If, this was, if we were in a science lesson, we would now conduct an experiment to either prove or disprove what you're saying. Okay? So that lunchtime, they run to the lab, the science lab, and there's nobody about, and they conduct their experiment. Okay? And this chapter is called The Experiment. Do I have to wear these? Peanut pulled the school-issue plastic safety goggles over her head and let the elastic strap snap against the back of her skull. Safety first, so you last, replied Rockwell, pleased with himself for remembering one of their science teacher's many catchphrases. Right, let's do this. Where's this pencil? Peanut pulled it out from her blazer pocket and handed it to Rockwell. He cradled it with both hands as if it were the elder wand and slowly lifted it up towards the light. Peanut thought she could hear the hallelujah chorus playing somewhere. It's beautiful, he said in a strange trance-like voice. <gasps> then he burst out laughing. Peanut, who had thought he was being serious, immediately flushed with embarrassment. Rockwell realised that he'd misjudged the situation. Uh, actually, I uh, think that maybe you should do this. I I it is your pencil after all, he stammered, handing it back to Peanut. Of course I should do this, harumped Peanut. She grabbed the pencil from him and pulled a sketchbook from her rucksack. She sat at the bench and started to draw. Again, she was struck by the pencil's weight and how easily the lead seemed to glide across the page. It was as smooth as silk. She was so caught up with how nice the pencil felt to hold that she'd almost finished the picture before she realised what it was she was drawing. It was an apple, exactly like the one that Rockwell had given her on the way to school that morning. Peanut looked at her sketch and smiled. It was good, better than usual. In fact, she thought it might be the best drawing she'd ever done. She held the pencil up to her eye, studied the tip, then picked up the sketchbook, turned around and held it up to show Rockwell. Crikey, he exclaimed. <gasps> it's brilliant. She felt her cheeks redden. She ripped the page out of the sketchbook, grabbed a piece of tape and stuck the drawing to the whiteboard. OK, she said. Pick up the apple. Rockwell laughed. <laughs> yeah, right, he said. But Peanut wasn't smiling. Oh, you mean you actually want me to do this, he said. Oh, come on, the joke's over now. If this is your way of trying to make me look like an idiot, it's not going to work. Look, said Peanut, you said yourself you have to conduct a controlled experiment to either prove or disprove a hypothesis. Well, my theory is that the stuff I draw with this pencil becomes real. If you're so smart, why don't you prove me wrong? Rockwell looked at her. He could tell she was serious. OK, you asked for it. He reached out towards the picture, extending his fingers as if to grab the apple. He glanced over at Peanut and smiled. He looked back at the drawing and took a deep breath. Then something very strange happened. At the point where Rockwell expected to feel the surface of the paper, he felt nothing. Not a sausage. In fact, his hand just kept moving. It kept moving into the drawing, straight towards the piece of fruit. Two seconds later, to his utter amazement, his fingertips touched the apple. Instinctively, his hand closed around it, and then, miracle of miracles, Rockwell pulled Peanut's sketch out of the sheet of paper and held it in his hand. <gasps> so, they did the experiment. And it was true. Whatever she drew with that pencil, it would become real. So, the real question is... No. <laughs> the real question is not alien. The real question is, what would you draw if you had a magic pencil like that? So you've ha you find this pencil, you realise whatever you draw with it becomes real. What would you draw? Anyone got any ideas? What would you draw? You would draw a dog. A little dog. So a little pet that you could keep around with you. Yes. Money. <laughs> Do you know what? That was my answer too. I would draw a big pile of money. A monster truck that looks like an alien. That is very specific and very cool. I think that's a great idea. A unicorn. That's a very popular answer, actually. Unicorn. <laughs> the old infinite wishes trick. That is very clever. That is very smart. Oh. 
Oh, well, you don't need a best best friend, do you? You just you just need. I think it's good to have lots of friends, to be honest. A couple more. Yes. Another unicorn. What's an alicorn? Is it? I d did. Does everyone know this apart from me? I didn't know that. Oh, well, Jim. Oh, wow. An alicorn. That's amazing. Should I, t should I tell you what I would draw? A door. <laughs> I know. <laughs> what? Uh, I would draw a door. Now, it doesn't sound very interesting to start with, does it? But if you think about it, if you draw a door that became real, that means you could open it. And I wonder, if you drew an illustrated door and you opened it, I wonder where that would lead. And do you know what? That's what Peanut does in my story. After they realise the pencil is magic, she draws a door, they open it, and they walk through the door and find themselves in a completely illustrated world. So the sky looks like it's painted on canvas. The trees look like they are drawn with bits of charcoal. And they walk around this world. It's quite a sort of snowy world. And they find this sign, and they realise that they're in an illustrated city. And this city is called Chroma. And they spot this sign posted, and they realise that the city is made up of lots and lots of different districts. Here we go, here's a map of the city. Right at the centre of the city is a huge white spire, almost a mile tall. And around that white spire is a rainbow lake, where the water is actual rainbow colours. And they meet somebody who tells them all about the history of the city. And the rainbow lake is famous worldwide, because whoever swims in it, they become unbelievably creative when they get out. They just have this urge to draw and to paint. And not only that, but they realise that this city has been around for hundreds of years and all of the great artists that we all know, the very famous artists in our world, they've all visited the city at some point and swum in the Rainbow Lake. And you can see here on the map, some of the districts have been named after famous artists. We have Darley Point West, Warholia. Over here we have Vincent Fields. What are, does anyone know an artist whose first name is Vincent? Vincent van Gogh. So van Gogh has been here, swum in the Rainbow Lake, then gone back to the real world and painted all his beautiful paintings. We have a district up here called the Strip, which is like a comic book district where everyone looks like a cartoon character, a superhero or a manga character. Whenever they speak, a little voice bubble appears. So it's very hard to keep a secret there. That's what I would say. But there's a really nice world here to set our adventure story. So Peanut makes her way into this world, and she realises that whatever she can draw with this pencil, she can just draw in the air with this pencil in the world. So she's drawing here a little ball, and the reason she's drawing a ball in the air is because she meets a little dog hiding behind a tree. And this little dog is the dog that you've all just drawn. And his name is Doodle. Doodle! I describe him in the book as a scribble of fur with legs and a tail. So that's why I did the legs so simply, because he's an illustrated dog. And he plays a really important part in this adventure story as they are looking for Peanut's dad. They think Peanut's dad might be somewhere in this illustrated city. And they meet all sorts of characters who help them on their way, including a giant alligator who helps them to swim across the inky lake. Some characters are good, like this superhero here. Some characters are bad. And some characters are funny. And some characters are really, really cute, but then they turn out to not be quite so cute. <laughs> okay, so there's, and some, ca oh, this is the really big bad guy. His name is Mr. White, and he wants to destroy all of the creativity within Chroma, the illustrated city, and he wants to destroy all of the creativity in the whole world. So we need to keep an eye on Mr. White. But there's lots of fun adventures that the guys have in the book, using their art equipment, um, to fight their battles and help them on their way. And, um, and it's an action-packed adventure story, and I really, really hope that if you guys read it, you enjoy it, because this is my very first chapter book. I've never written one before. All of my books up until this point have been picture books, like Odd Dog Out, so this one's for slightly older children, but it's really fun. Nice short chapters, mums and dads for bedtime reading. And it's called Peanut Jones and the Illustrated City, and I'm going to play you a little trailer. Here we go.
So there we go. So I am super, 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 oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm super proud of this book. I don't think I've ever been proud of anything I've ever written in my life. So I'm, uh, yeah, I'm just fingers crossed that people like it. Now, that's it. Pretty much all we have time for. I want to say a big thank you for coming to see me today. And I also wanted to leave you with a couple of things to remember. A pencil, whether it's magic or not, every single pencil actually is a magic wand. Okay, There is magic inside every single pencil. You just need to unleash that magic. So keep on drawing, everyone. And also, I want you to remember to keep an eye out. Or aliens. Thank you so much for coming along today. It's really nice to see you all this morning. And I hope you had a nice time. And if you want me to sign your little books, I will do so afterwards. I can sign that. I can do that for you. You might be going downstairs to do that. Yes.